So tonight, it's the apology. I'm going to explore the apology and explore one idea, and that is if Socrates was a philosopher, he was a very curious kind of philosopher in the sense that no one else can be. And therefore, it's going to show the uniqueness of Socrates, both in terms of philosophy and as a religious figure. So that's going to be our goal. Right. Unique, both in the terms of philosophy and now, I want to use the word religious in a different sense. Religious sometimes signifies from the Latin to be bound together. So, rather than that, I'll say spiritual. Therefore, he is unique both in presenting himself as a philosopher, and his uniqueness is really rooted in the fact that he has a very interesting, profound spiritual relationship with God, and therefore that marks him as unique, both in terms of philosophy and among other spiritual leaders, both present and the past. So, as we usually do, I would first just like to look at the architecture of the work. Let this be the entire dialogue. It starts in terms of pages 17, and the Greek, Stephanus number 17a, and it ends at 42a. Some 25 pages. The apology, presumably, on one level, is <clears throat> Socrates' defense. And the whole issue of the apology is what is he defending? That's what we want to explore. He talks about the charges against him as the old charges and the new charges. He introduces the old charges first at 19, two pages, as it were, into the text. It goes on to 24, and then he says, that's enough. So the old charges extend from 19 to 24. The new charges pick up at 24 and go to 27D. And at 27D, he says, that's enough. So the question that we have is rather curious. Let's see if we can make it even clearer. At 36A, the vote, first vote, there are two votes. And then there's the second vote. And that's at 38C. The official charges are what he calls the new. They're the new. So therefore, in terms of the dialogue itself, the formal charges against which he presumably is to defend himself occupy approximately four pages, three to four pages. Those are the official charges. These are the charges written on the affidavit. And, uh, These are the official charges. So therefore, they're going to be an interesting point of good heavens. If the official charges constitute the bulk of the work, that's the official charges, and he's finished with the 
his defense, then what's the whole thing doing? Look here, we have 25 pages. We have 25 pages. He's only occupying four for the formal charges. The old are not charges. He calls these the old prejudices that he wants to answer. So here is this curious fellow. He's being formally charged with breaking Athenian law. And according to Athenian law, at the bottom of the charges, you have to state what you think is the sentence. Therefore, when Socrates received the affidavit, he knew that the sentence proposed by those who accused him was death. Therefore, you have to vote twice. You have to vote first to see whether or not you consider that he is guilty of the charges. Now there are 501 people in the jury. So the first vote must be the 501 must decide whether he's guilty of the charges. Then Socrates can offer an alternative sentence. Then it goes back to the jury and they have to decide between Socrates' alternative sentence and the one specified in the affidavit. Well, right on the surface of it, it's rather curious, isn't it? That here we have a work called The Apology, and he only takes four pages on the whole thing. That's all he pays attention to. He announces the charges. Four pages later, he says, that's enough. I've had enough of this. And he sets it aside. And he's now going to engage in a new and entirely different subject. And the real, the real defense, therefore, that he's making is a defense against prejudices. That's his defense. And we have to know, good heavens, what is he talking about? What is he talking about, these prejudices? What kind? And why is he spending this amount of energy when he should be preparing himself against the formal charges, the affidavit, and instead he wants to deal with these charges which he calls the old accusers. He said, they've been accusing me of something for years and years and years. He said, they've got you when you were young as children. They've been pumping these things into you. He said, I must deal with them first. And therefore, what he does is quite remarkable and interesting. He makes believe, he makes believe that these old accusers have prepared a document and therefore he reads off a make-believe, a make-believe set of charges. That's what he does. He says, now I'm going to make believe that I'm reading a make-believe set of charges to express into words what they really are accusing me of. And what they're really accusing me of is this old prejudice. How long does he take for that? Just four pages or so, just like that. Then he picks up the affidavit and he says, and now I'm going to treat the affidavit as if it is merely another set of accusers. That's all he's doing. So the old accusations against Socrates based upon an old prejudice, he pulls them together and makes believe that's the affidavit he's going to defend himself again and that he spends this much time on it. Four pages. He says, that's enough. Then he picks up the actual affidavit with the charges, and he says, you know what I'm going to do now? He says, I'm going to deal with them as if they were merely another set of accusers. Four pages, it's all over. So our question is going to be, good heavens, now look here. What's going on in the bulk of the dialogue?
practically 10 pages. This material, what's going on? Could have been left out. Could have been left out entirely. Matter of fact, you might even argue, he didn't need this either. He could have just simply rolled out the written affidavit and defended himself and have four-page dialogue, and that'd be the end of it. But let's give him the fact that he is now trying to answer his accusers who are charging him against an old prejudice of theirs. And so we have the first, the old ac accusations, and then the affidavit, which he treats as another set of accusers. And let's just dispense with that in the way in which he does so well. So the first thing he does is read off that great set of charges, make-believe charges. And I'll read that for you at 19. But I must tell you first now, Socrates is very careful to address the jury, and you're going to be in the jury box tonight, and he's going to ask you to do this. Please pay careful attention. Observe and pay attention as to whether what I say is just or not. So you're in the jury box, and you have to decide whether what he's doing is just or not. Because it is peculiar. All right, now the first set of false accusations brought against him, he says, there's a certain Socrates, a wise man, a ponderer over things in the air, and one who has investigated the things beneath the earth and who has made the weaker argument the, the stronger. He said, these are the people who are my dangerous enemies because they caught you when you were young and they spoke to you and convinced you at a very early age And there was no defense, he says. There was no defense against these early accusations against me. It's not even possible to know their names. They're all shadows. Then, curiously enough, he puts these aside, you see, and he rephrases this set. And this is then, we can really call this 2A, first set, and then the the uh, subsidiary second set, he says, well, he said, I'll, look, I'll tell you what, he said, uh, I must make a defense against these. He said, what should I do? He said, I, I, should, I should take up from the beginning the question of the acquisition of this false prejudice directed against me. And therefore, he said, how am I going to do that? I must explain, he said, what aroused the prejudice in these men. And therefore, he said, I tell you what I must do, he said, I must read their sworn statement as if it were the plaintiffs. So we have something curious here, see? We have a restatement of the accusation in two forms. One course comes from Aristophanes. And here's the second. Socrates is a criminal and a busybody, investigating the things beneath the earth and in the heavens and making the weaker argument stronger and teaching others the same things. Is this the one I will deal with? He says, I'll deal with this. And he says, look here, the, the whole idea that I have some wisdom it's just simply wrong. I have no wisdom. He said, if anybody can investigate the things beneath the earth and in the upper heavens, he said, it's very good. I think it's wonderful that they have such skills. He said, I don't have any. So he discusses this and shows them to be found groundless. He said, therefore, look here, it might occur to you, therefore, to raise the question, if I'm rejecting all of these early accusations against me, then how is it that I gained a certain reputation for these very things? He said, I'll tell you how the prejudice arose. 
This was a friend of mine, Shafiron. He said, have the trouble to go before the Delphic Oracle and ask them about me. So he went before the Delphic Oracle and he was so bold as to ask the Delphic Oracle the question. He asked if anyone was wiser than I. And the answer was no one is wiser. Now, you have to picture this, all right? He's going to give you the reason why this prejudice was built up against him. His friend went up to the Delphic Oracle and said, no one is wiser. Now, he's, the Delphic Oracle is sacred to Apollo. No one is wiser. No. If he accepts the gods of the state, Apollo is a god of the state, Athena, Apollo, I imagine he would accept that. But he says, after hearing this, he said, you know what, I, he said, uh, I decided to do something. He said, I decided that I should prove the utterance wrong. This is 21C. He said, I couldn't believe it. I was wise. He said, so I decided to prove the utterance wrong. And that is, I would show the oracle that it is not true. And so I went around examining and examining. So we went around to various groups of people, first the politicians, public officials, then the poets, then the workers, and he tried to demonstrate that the oracle was wrong, that they were wiser than he. And he says, no, each one of those cases I discovered that it's not true, that none of those people were wiser than I am. He said, but therefore I came to a very interesting conclusion about this strange kind of wisdom. He says, I'm neither wise in their wisdom nor foolish in their folly. He says, I know what the Delphic Oracle meant then. What he really meant was that human wisdom is li of little or no value. So, well, you know, as I went around to this one group after the other group, I first went to the politicians, the poets, and the workmen. A lot of young people came around and followed me. And they were influenced by me, and they started imitating what I do. He said, that's true. That's what they were doing. But I didn't teach them. They picked up things by themselves, what they saw me doing. So therefore, they think I'm corrupting the youth. But then when I ask them, by teaching them what? And doing what? He says, because I, I haven't taught them anything, and I'm not doing anything other than going around questioning. They're at a loss. Now, here's a line I want you to have. They have nothing to say, but they do not know. And that they may seem to be at a loss. And they say these things that are handy to say against all philosophers. These are the things they say against all philosophers. That's what they're doing. It's against all philosophers that they're charging us. He says, that's what they're doing. Is they're charging. This is the this is the prejudice. He said, but I don't think I'll be able to remove this prejudice from you in so short a time as a lot of me at this point. He says, but I do want to review it. And yet I know pretty well that I'm making myself hated by just this conduct that I have, which is also a proof that I'm speaking the truth. And this is the prejudice against me, and these are its causes. Well, he says, now, as far as these accusations are concerned, which my first accusers made against me, this is sufficient. He says, now there's another set. 
So once more, I will pick up this charge, he says, but I'll treat it as if they were another set of accusers. Let us take it up in turn. Let's take these charges up. Right, now these are the formal charges. Socrates is a wrongdoer, corrupts the young, and does not believe in the gods the state believes in, but other new spiritual beings instead. Socrates doesn't believe in the gods in the state, but he believes in other new spiritual beings instead. I'm a wrongdoer, he says. That's it, he says. Corrupts the youth, doesn't believe in the gods the state believes in, but in other new spiritual beings instead. He says, this is, not, this is what I really must deal with. This is now is what I'm going to deal with these criminal wrongdoer. Corrupt the youth. I don't believe in the gods the state believes in, but in other new spiritual beings instead. Of course, he already gave evidence, didn't he, that many of the young people do follow him around and imitate him, and in that sense, he's corrupting them. By the way, does he show that he believes in the gods of the state when he's trying to disprove the Delphic Oracle? He did say he was going to disprove the Delphic Oracle. That was his goal, to go around to disprove it. Well, that's an interesting charge. Does, because if Socrates does believe in new spiritual beings instead, then of course he broke the law. I have a great quote I want to share with you, and um, I'm at uh, 31D. Perhaps it may seem strange that I go about and interfere in other people's affairs to give this advice in private, but don't venture to come before your assembly and advise the state. The reason for this, as you have heard me say it many times in many places, is that something that something divine and spiritual comes to me. The very thing which Miletus ridiculed as indictment and put in the affidavit. It's affidavit. I have had this from my childhood. It's a sort of voice that comes to me. And when it comes, it always holds me back from what I'm thinking or of doing, but never urges me forward. It's this which opposes my engaging in politics. Now, he's reminding the, the jury, just like I'm reminding you, that in this day affidavit drawn up by Miletus, this very charge is there. And in this quote, he's even reminding you
that there is something divine and spiritual comes to me, the very thing which Miletus ridiculed as indictment. And then he does the count of the fact, he does say he believes in it. Well, would you not agree? He's giving evidence against himself. He's giving evidence here against himself. He's giving evidence that he is not believing in the, in the Delphic Oracle. Matter of fact, he's going to try to disprove it. He indicates, yes, that many people do follow him around and imitate him. In that sense, he is corrupting the youth, but not corrupting them in his sense, only in their sense. So now look here. If this is true, and we have evidence that he doesn't believe in the Delphic Oracle, nor does he cite in, in his defense any reference to any of the Greek gods, And therefore, if he agrees that uh, it can be said that people are corrupted being in his company, by their reasoning, then all the way down the line, he's giving evidence that he's guilty. Formally guilty of the charges. Whether or not the charges are just is another question. But if this is their law, He's giving evidence, is he not, that he did break the law. He's giving arguments to show that he's guilty. And therefore, when the people vote, if they look at the evidence, which he himself gives, no one char charges him with anything additional, he's guilty. And so the vote is made. And the vote comes, comes out, and uh, sure enough, they uh, find him guilty of the charges. And then Socrates considers his whole case, and he then recommends an alternative sentence, which is, he says, I think I deserve something since I've been doing so much for the state my whole life. He says, I want maintenance, free room and board, I want to be maintained, so I, I want free room and board in the Prytaneum, which is one of the great sacred buildings up in the Acropolis for the rest of my life. And since we know something about the riotous parties he attended in the symposium, and all his cronies piling in at the last minute and drinking up a storm, that's a very interesting alternative sentence. Free room and board in the Prytanium. It's like the Blair House. And so they go back once more, and they say, Socrates, we can't accept this alternative sentence. Death. And that's the dialogue. Only thing we have to wonder about is what's this? Ten pages. You see, it's half of the dialogue. Look here, 17 to 27. 27 to 27, 36. All right, there we go. Or just a little bit short of it if we pick it up at 19. <laughs> what's this middle what's this middle section doing? And that's really what I want to talk about. That's where we're going. So let's take a look at what he's doing. Now I'd like to present therefore um, Seven is right, that's right. I want to make sure I'm using a different text than I usually use. I have to find it. Um, at tw exactly at 28, at 28, 
Well then, men of Athens, Socrates addressing the whole audience, 501 in the jury box. Well, men of Athens, that I am not wrong, that I am not a wrongdoer according to Meletius' indictment, seems to me not to need much of a defense. But what I have said is enough. That ends it. That's all. But you may be assured that what I said before is true. That great hatred has risen against me in the minds of many persons. And this it is which will cause my condemnation. If it is to cause it, not Miletus or Anitas, but the prejudice and dislike of the many. This has condemned many other good men, and I think will do so, and there's no danger it will stop with me. So it'll go on. It's not Miletus, it's this prejudice. It's not going to end. He said, well then, you might ask then, why am I conducting myself the way I am doing? What am I doing it for, he says. You think, well, I'll tell you. He says, I must tell you what I'm doing. So I have a post. I have a post, very much like in the military. For thus it is, men of Athens, in truth, that wherever a man stations himself, think it's the best to be there, or is stationed there by his commander, there he must, as it seems to me, remain and run his risks, considering neither death nor any other thing more than disgrace. He said, I've been commanded in military posts, and that's where I, I, I have placed myself. Here's where it starts now. But when the God gave me a station, as I believed and understood, with orders to spend my life in philosophy and examining myself and others, there, right, that's his post, with orders to spend my life in philosophy and examining myself and others. He said, if I were to desert my post, through fear of death or anything else, he said, I would be disobeying the God. He said, don't worry about death. There's nothing to fear about death. So he thinks he, thinks he has been assigned this post by God. For know that the God commands me to do this. And I believe that no greater good ever came to pass in the city than my service to the God. He said, I just go around and tell you to take care of your souls. That's my job. He said, no better thing has happened in Athens. Now I'm going to say some things to you at which you might, you know, perhaps cry out. But do not do so by any means. For I know if you kill me, I being such a man as I am, you, you will not injure me as much as yourselves. For neither Miletus nor Anitas could injure me. That would be impossible. For I believe it is not God's will that a better man should be injured by a worse. And so, men of Athens, I am now making my defense not for my own sake, as one might imagine, but far more for yours, that you may not, by condemning me, err in your treatment of the gift God gave you. He sees himself as a gift of God. He said, if you put me to death, you know, he said, you won't, you, won't, you won't easily find another. He said, I'll tell you what I am. He said, I'm a gadfly. 
I think that God fastened me upon the city in some such capacity. And I go about arousing and urging and reproaching each one of you, constantly alighting upon you everywhere the whole day long. Oh yes, he says, you know, perhaps you might be angry like people awakened from a nap and might slap me as Anitos advises and easily kill me. Then you'd pass the rest of your lives in a slumber unless God in his care for you should send someone else to sting you. And that I am, as I say, a kind of gift from the gods you might understand from this. Now, I made a rather bold statement before I said that I want to make a claim that I think Socrates is making a unique claim. And the uniqueness has not so far been addressed. I now want to see whether I can address it. And why then do people love to spend much of their time with me? You've heard the reason, men of Athens. For I told you the whole truth. It's because they like to listen when those are examined who think they are wise and are not so, for it is amusing. But, as I believe, I have been commanded to do this by the God. Now watch the statement, very interesting statement. Through oracles and dreams and in every way in which any man has ever been commanded by divine power to say anything whatsoever. I've been commanded to do this by the God, through oracles and dreams, and in every way in which any man has ever command, been commanded by divine power to do anything whatsoever. That's a rather bold statement. Isn't it? He's making a claim that he is unique. There's the uniqueness from Socrates. Socrates, hey, there it is. Now, you know, um, one of the old rhetorical tricks is that after you uh, make your statement, you try to leave something for the people to remember you, right? Some old rhetorical trick. Well, Socrates has a great line. Just before they go to judge whether or not he's guilty of the charges, he has one statement. He brings them, and it goes all the way back from the beginning and pulls it all together. This is the last sentence before the vote. So I'll read you the sentence before it and include the last sentence because it's the background. Do not therefore, men of Athens, demand of me that I act before you in a way which I consider neither honorable nor right nor pious, especially when impiety is the very thing for which Miletus here has brought me to trial. For it's plain that by persuasion and supplication. I force you to break your oaths. I should uh, teach you to disbelieve in the existence of the gods, and in making my defense should accuse myself of not believing in them. All right, here it is. But that's far from the truth, for I do believe in them, the gods, for I do believe in them, men of Athens, more than any of my accusers. And I entrust my case to you and to God to decide. It is, uh, uh, it is as, as it shall be best both for me and for you. 
For I do believe in them, right? I do believe in the gods, men of Athens, more than any of my accusers. And I'll entrust my case to you and to God to decide. You see, he's being charged with whether or not he believes, whether he does, the charge is whether Socrates does not believe in the gods of the state. And here's the last line, I do believe in them, men of Athens, more than any of my accusers. I do believe in them, more than anyone. All he had to do was mention Athena, Apollo, the gods. He doesn't take time out to enumerate any of them. But I do believe them in the sense that none of my other accusers do. Let me give you another translation and you'll see the fun in this quote. But I am far from that, gentlemen. I do believe in a sense in which none of my accusers does. I do believe in a sense in which none of my accusers does. I do believe in a sense that none of my accusers does. Then he believes in the gods in a totally different way than any, and different from any of the senses in which his accusers believe in God. And they want to know whether or not he does, in fact, believe in other new spiritual beings instead. And he's already admitted that. So they judge him guilty. So I have selected a whole bunch of quotes that in this section deals with Socrates' relationship to himself and to God. He sees that he has been assigned a post. He sees, therefore, in that post, not only individual men, but that he has a duty to Athens. Right. That's a duty to wake up a whole city. He thinks there's no better show in town than his show. He thinks he's been commanded to do that. And he thinks no one else Right, I've been commanded in a way in which, in every single way in which any man has been um, urged to do the divine. So I've met them all, oracles and dreams, and in every way in which any man has ever been commanded by a divine force to deal with, with this issue, and that's what he does. So he's placing himself on the very high level of spirituality. So what is he defending? He's defending philosophy, that's what he's defending. His brand of philosophy. His brand of philosophy is the, expresses itself on that level of spirituality which we find in the other dialogues as well as here. So let me throw it open to questions. I think I've said enough. And does it mean that if he believes in a, in a different way than the of that he's actually believing in different gods? Well, that's the issue, isn't it? Let me do it again. You can see it again. If you go in one translation, it will go in one direction much more than in the other. I do believe in a sense in which none of my accusers does. Okay? I do believe that would be in the gods, right? in a sense in which none of my accusers does. Therefore, he does believe in them, but in a sense totally different than the way in which his accusers believe in God. You, you, uh, Wait, just for, let me give the contrast. For I do believe in them, men of Athens, more than any of my accusers. More than, in a different sense than. But in either case, He's blanketing, whichever one you want, right? He's blanketing the, the case that he, yeah, he does believe in the gods. But he also sees he's introduced others as well. He what? He's introduced others, like his daimon. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Now you, um, 
you said that line like four times earlier and I didn't get the insight that he was addressing the accuser's um, accusation, their charge against him until just now, until she asked the question that, yes, I do believe in God's and in other things that my accusers did, just dealing with their charge, yeah. uh, reflecting their separation from his brand of spirituality in their accusation. That Socrates does not believe in the gods that the state believes in. And the last line, whichever one you want, is, yes, I do believe in the gods of the state. By the way, I believe in them in a sense in which none of you do. And that's the sentence they're now going to carry with them. Now, can you conclude from that that, yes, he does believe in the gods of the state believes in? Does this imply in any way that there is a way in which you believe in the gods of the state? And he's saying, by the way, I believe in the gods. In what sense does he believe in them? It's not specified. It's not stated. He, he does agree that he's radical. Oh, yes. It's oh, yes. A, either more or other way. Either way, he doesn't believe in the orthodoxy. Well, that's the way it reads, doesn't it? Yeah. That's the way it reads. And in all of the time that he's invoking the god, in this whole section, and I think I read six or seven of them, in no way does it look like it's one of the gods that the state believes in. He could have said at that point, by the way, and some, there's some question about whether or not one of the Greek, one, one of our gods happens to have been the, the, the cause of, water, of uh, signing me this post, while well, it happens to be Apollo. He didn't do that. Right? It's, it's nameless. But the gods that the state believes in, he could have taken the opportunity at that time and said, well, actually, it's Artemis. I think it's Artemis that commanded me because she has that kind of duty. Or it could be Athena. No names. Now, this is his defense, and if you would agree with me, that you don't want the jury to walk out with questions about your intention or what you mean, what you're doing. And it looks like, therefore, you can freely... See, is the question... It's often people think, some, uh, some authors, especially the translator of this dialogue that we just, I just read, think the charge is that he's an atheist, that their charge, the state is charging him with atheism. But that's not the case. It's not the case that he's an atheist. If he believes in other new spiritual... I mean, that's what I was under the impression, too, but how can he be charged with other new spiritual beings if he's an atheist? Yeah, right. And... Yeah, in, uh, instead of the gods of the state. Yeah. When he begins to dialogue with Miletus, mm -hmm. he, Miletus changes it to atheism. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but even though he was able to make him change the statement, the affidavit, the statements, and the charge in the affidavit remain the charges. Yeah, yeah right, yeah, so yeah. he contradicted his own. Yeah, yeah. Now, in the earlier dialogues, he does charges. talk about the gods of the state. He does talk about Zeus, etc. In the, er the, the earlier part of the apology? No, no, in, other in other dialogues. Oh, yes, he yes, does yes, use, yes, so yes. He has, again, yeah. um, but he's doing it in a different way. So mm -hmm. it's not a question of their names, mm -hmm. rather a question of, is it orthodoxy or heterodoxy? Certainly, well, certainly unorthodox. Right. I mean, that's, that's the whole accusation. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, what, yeah, yeah. you know, he, he, mm -hmm. he's... Uh, yeah. And he's turning, he's turning the whole trial. The trial is these formal charges. Mm -hmm. He's turning it against them and saying, look, I want to take this last dialogue that I'm going to have. He dialogues with the whole city, 501 people. And he wants to now defend philosophy against the accusers. <laughs> that the accusers have prejudice against philosophy. So he's turning the entire court scene 
into a defense of philosophy. That's what he's doing in the first set of charges. That's what he's doing here, justifying it here. So he turns the whole case upside down. So the, the last major public dialogue that he has, he argues with the state. And that's a nice thing to do. If you have the opportunity to dialogue with the whole state, 501 people in the jury. Mm -hmm. I'm puzzled about something. He's being guided by dreams, oracles, in any way man is being commanded by God. And he follows through with that. Is that, is there any other indication of how that's different? Is that different than what the state would uh, believe in, in terms of relating to the gods, or? Pardon me, I, I don't understand your question. Is that in any way different than the way in which the state would believe in gods? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Does he give an indication of how the Pardon, pardon me, let me make sure I have it. You, are, are you asking whether or not a, a contemporary Greek at the time of Plato, in the time of this statement, would look at that as evidence of the way in which they believed in the gods, their own gods? Yes. Well, uh, there are two things with that. One is uh, we have to judge just in terms of the dialogue itself. And uh, even if he were to make that statement, he didn't take the opportunity at that time to mention one of the, that, by the way, one of the gods that. Uh, has been directing me to do this my whole life. Uh, the game of philosophy, by the way, happens to be Athena. He didn't name it. He could have named it and chose not to. Let me give it back. I've been commanded to do this by the God through oracles and dreams in every way in which any man has ever been commanded by divine power to do anything whatsoever. At that time he could have said, you know, I've been commanded to do this by Apollo, the oracles, or... It sounds like a very monotheistic statement to say, too, by the God, you know, I mean, within the polytheistic system, his new spiritual being, which I presume that's what he's talking about. Well, when he says God, he's talking about the one, right? Right, I mean, it seems... So he could say, a God. Right. Your God, our God, the God. My God. My God. Thank God. you. Or, hmm? or, God. or just let, let, it, let the whole business of the article drop out. I have been commanded by God. Well, this is the whole problem, isn't it? What's the significance of this? Because we know if this were chosen, it would mean then that they are other gods. That would be quite appropriate, a god, since they are polytheism. Right? Your god. I identify, by the way, I'm identifying with your god. Same god with your god. That's the god that has urged me to do this. My god. Uh-oh, dangerous. Different. Our God, communicality, we both share the same thing. God, unspecified. The God, uh-oh. No, 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 that's not A. Sitting there saying that to me. You know? Yeah. I mean, putting, yeah. he's putting himself on such a pedestal. Oh, that's right. That that's right. I'd be stoked. Pardon, pardon me. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, this is, <laughs> this man is making the most astonishing claim. Yeah. And we can say it's egoistic or we can say it's simple and but straight, depending upon how, how you read it. He yeah. tried to prove Delphi wrong. And I mean, to me, that his proof of Delphi isn't a certain disbelief in Apollo, it is a reductio ad absurdum. He goes, you know, he does it mm -hmm. rather than blind faith, just saying, okay, they say you're the wisest person, mm -hmm. 
I mean, it'd be pretty stupid to accept that without any proof. So he goes and says, okay, let's assume that Delphi is wrong. So I, I would meet somebody wiser. And mm -hmm. so he is, um, in a certain way, by this time saying the God is not his personal egotism, it is mm, modesty of the wisest person, if that makes sense. See, isn't that interesting because um, he, uh, Shafiron goes to the Delphic Oracle and says, is anyone wiser than Socrates? And the Delphic Oracle comes out, no one is wiser. Socrates then says, oh, this can't be. I will disprove the oracle. That's his language. Right? I sought to disprove it. And if we're all in a Greek world, and Apollo is a sacred Apollo, and he's the Delphic <laughs> oracle, and you're just hearing, what did he say? He's going to disprove, and he goes around to disprove it. And then when he can't, right, because that's, it turns out that he does disprove it. But he changes it by saying, oh, he says, I, I must restate what the Delphic Oracle meant. Well, the Delphic, whether Delphic Oracle meant that or not, it certainly wasn't what the Delphic Oracle said. That is, that no one is wiser. Socrates said, well, I think I know what the Delphic Oracle meant. What he really meant to, meant to say is that, that no man is wise and the gods alone are wise. That's a great statement. But was that the original statement? No, yeah, no. What impact did this have then? Well, pardon me? What impact did this have on the state shortly thereafter, and maybe in a little longer term, if it carried the uh, From some people who, are, who read history, I have been told that this, was, this, this kind of affidavit was never again written. This ended these kinds of affidavit. But I don't know whether that's true, you know. Historians say that after this kind of affidavit written by Miletus and Antitos, no further charge like this was ever filed against a person. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Did they, were they, did they seem regretful after the, they issued the death sentence? Uh, uh, there's the dialogue that follows this, there are two dialogues that follow this that pick up that theme. One is the Credo, and the other is the Phaedo. And in the Credo, time has passed, and um, therefore there's time for reflection in the state. And Credo, quite wealthy and old friend of Socrates, comes to the jail and says, look, we have everything paid. The jailer has been paid. Everybody has been paid off. Everyone has had a kind of second thought. You can just walk out that gate right now. Leave your cell. There's a boat in the harbor. Say goodbye to all your friends. Get on board. And you're free. So yes, there is a sense from the credo that there was a second thought about it. And perhaps they judge rashly. Yeah. 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 At least that's one way to measure it. Ironically, I was wondering say that he's no one, no one is wiser, and that comes from the Delta Gore, and he actually ended up believing in the state, which would be believing in that Delta Gore. So he ended up believing in the, in the Delta Gore? I said, if he did, oh. then he would be believing, I take it, in what the state believed in, yeah. which means that he is, actually, he is no wise, he is, there is no one wiser than himself. If he believed it, that would be one of the consequences. Which? Th thank goodness he didn't. No, I just wondered. Yeah. I just thought it was ironic. Funny, because hmm. they're the ones that are claiming that because he doesn't. Um, because, because he does? Well, he doesn't believe in the gods of the state. And well, I, I don't think there's evidence that he does not believe in the gods of the state. I think there's sufficient evidence that there were many opportunities for him to declare that he did believe in one of the gods of the state and chose not to, even in his own defense. That wasn't 
there's definitely a difference between his, his belief in God and the accuser's belief in God. That's what he says himself. Yes, quite true. How do you know it's a demon? Where is it, where is it uh, that you get the information that the God that Socrates would be looking for would be a demon? No, no. No, I didn't. Say, I, I was just making up some names, oh, possibilities. Okay. Right. Artemis, Athena. Saying, so no, no. No. You, you knew for a no, no, I used more than one. Oh, okay. Um, do you have any idea where chronologically the Delphic Oracle, uh, what they said about Socrates, took place? I'm just wondering whether that happened before or after he has gone through all this conversation with the Divine. Or has that been happening his whole life? Well, the voice had been with him from childhood. From childhood. We know that. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Shafiron has been dead a long while, he said. And therefore, a long while, whatever Socrates was at that time, minus a long while as the age one. But beyond that, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. So that's when he started his questioning. That's when he actively Yes, yes, that's when he actively went around because that's when he sought to disprove the oracle and therefore he went around first to the political leaders and then the poets and then the workers, that's right. So it looks early, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how early, I don't know. It, is, is this sort of analogous to the uh, mythology of Jesus Christ? Because I know he sort of went around, mythology, he sort of went around, you know, saying he believed in one God, all these people were following him around, you know, and then, then he went before, what, the um, conscious pilot or something, or the judgment, uh, blah, blah, blah. The guy sort of said, you know, well, I follow God, da, 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 all this stuff. So, yeah, yeah. They're both trials, but this is a lengthy defense. So of course, we don't have that on the side of the day of Jesus. Um, but there are certain similarities there. One is, of course, that the uh, biggest one is whether or not Socrates is a martyr. Yeah, you know, martyr is usually when you die for a belief. Well, It'd be interesting, you see, to take a look at the last words of Jesus and the last words of Plato, uh, pardon me, of uh, Socrates in the Phaedo. The last words of Socrates in the Phaedo are, uh, he pulls down the uh, blanket that was covering his face just as the poison is creeping up. And he says, uh, <clears throat> Credo, Credo. Credo, he calls his friend Credo. And he says, uh, we owe a cock to Asclepius, make sure it's paid. Make sure it's paid. Yeah. And Jesus, of course, you know, his last words is, uh, my God, my God, why, why has that uh, abandoned me, right? forsaken me? Mm -hmm. So they're, according in that to respect, which, they're which different. Which myth? Pardon me? According to which myth? Because there's multiple versions of the, of the death, Jesus' de death oh, scene. Oh, yeah, so of course. There is that's other true. ones yeah, which true. don't yeah, that was have one. that ending. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's right. Is it? That's right. Isn't it? It's over? Isn't that? Uh, I can't remember which gospel that's in one. Uh, has that. I no. mean, that's the one which I like. You know, I mean, no. and it's basically the same. And Mark doesn't have anything at that right, point. Right, but it's yeah. the same idea of you yeah. know, the cock. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's over. That one that you mentioned, why is thou forsaken me? That, that made me think about how uh, Socrates deal, talks about death in the Phaedo. And, and he says, if one has been uh, practicing death their whole life, why should they fear when it finally mm -hmm. comes around? And right before he dies, or mm -hmm. Jesus dies, he says, why is thou forsaken? But, w w wait a second. You're taken like out of context. You're taken out of context. No, right? no, no, no. I don't want to die. It, no, if you go back to the psalm mm -hmm. that he's quoting, or the mythographer is quoting, mm -hmm. that psalm ends up quite happily, if I remember rightly. Mm -hmm. So, in fact... Um, I don't know. What, what can you do with that quote? Why the quote, no, the quote is from a psalm. So whoever wrote that is, you have to take it back into context. I can't remember which psalm. I'll find out next week. Hmm? No, I'm saying, my God, no, my so God, why, why hast thou forsaken me? Is a quote back to a certain psalm. 
So you have to look at that psalm because that's just a reference. That's a quick mm -hmm. way. And at the end of that psalm, as far as I know, is happy. So he's, it is not a cry of, when we look at it out of context, we look at it as a cry of despair. But when we actually look at the end of that psalm, we see that, no, it's a cry of victory. That's one way That's one way of dealing with it, put it in the context of the psalms. Uh, in, in, the fa in the Phaedo, however, it would be, uh, see, the only time you offer up a cock is when, uh, to Asclepius, is when there's been a cure. So therefore, the last act of Socrates, or the last words he's making, is that, hey, Crito, there must have been some cure going on here. And if so, uh, we owe a cock to Asclepius. We, oh, by the way, not I, we. And that's one of the interesting features about the Phaedo's conclusion. Why did he get Credo, and why does he include the word we? Yeah. Pardon? Um, a victory, a cure, that's right. Yeah. Or that's right a victory. Right before he's about to yeah. die, yeah. he says there's a Pardon? cure going on. Pardon? Right before he's about to die? Yes. Yes, those are the last words. But couldn't the we... It just makes me think of the purification process talked about in that dialogue. Like if he's, about to, if he's about to take the trip upwards out of his yeah. body, yeah. then he's letting go of the final attachments if there are any. Yeah. No, you're quite right. It, then it would be better if it were. It would be better if it were. I owe a cock to Asclepius. Mm -hmm. Please make sure it's paid. Mm -hmm. That's why it's interesting. How it's we. It's we, not I. If his ego has disappeared and got into the union with no. it, whatever no. it is, the one, then surely it is we because he realizes that it is mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. one. We're all together in this one. Yeah, I don't think he got over his ego. <laughs> well, of course, that's the issue. You know, is the man just blatantly a superego or inflated ego? And I imagine one could say that about all religious leaders. They're all super, they all have an inflated ego. The question is whether or not it's hot air or not. Of course they're inflated. Some rise to eight and nine feet. Going back, going back to right, no. I didn't see it until later, but going back to the idea that if, if the Delta Oracle is something of the state, is um, that I'm surprised that Belinus and, the, and those people didn't go along with the fact that if Socrates is, the, there is no one wiser, then what he is in fact doing would be that which would be representing what the Delta Oracle is following. Yeah, if he didn't say, and if he didn't say that he's going to try to disprove it. Well, he does try to disprove it. Pardon? He, he does. Yeah. So it seems like they should be upset with that. Well, therefore, he doesn't believe in the God of the Delta Oracle. Usually, belief usually means that you agree with the pronouncement, you go along with it. Not that you try to disprove it. Right. Can you imagine the Old Testament, or one of the prophets saying, you know, I'm going to disprove this? So he should have gone along and believed it. <coughs> he should have. I didn't yeah, say that. I didn't say that. He, his, his vision I mean, is the opposite, yeah. I know, but Miletus would have said, you should have gone along and believed that no one is wiser, Socrates. If that's what the Delta <laughs> is saying, then you should believe that. And since you didn't, you didn't believe in the gods of the state believes in, therefore he's guilty. Yeah. When, when, when he says, uh, when the cock crows, we owe a payment, is this again another one of those like universal, absolute um, sacrifices? Because like, there's a cure, like it's a cure for him or is it a cure for all of us? Um, well, you want to deal with the we, yeah, yeah. so do I. Um, there are many ways of, of uh, Trying to understand that, yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, so yes, there yeah, just for a moment. Yeah. Interesting thing is that, like Jesus, there's no parallel, or Krishna, he has his mystical experiences from the time he's a child, he has these voices, whereas, let's say, Muhammad only had his first mystical experience when he was 40, so he. Um, and, as I said, the other two people come to mind immediately. 
there are stories is that both Jesus and Krishna appear to have had their yeah. you know, discussions with mm -hmm. the one very early in life, whereas others, you know, late bloomers. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah but he, Socrates appears to have handled it quite differently than those figures. Well, we, we, we're not going, we're, going, going about the question. We're only, we're only in touch with what their mythographers. I mean, you could say Plato is uh, Luke or Matthew or whatever to Socrates. Yeah, but Plato shows the method in the way he writes of questioning, dialogue, coming to conclusions from possible mm -hmm. premises. He has a method. Does it very clearly. Yeah. Right, but I'm saying that we don't know how much of that is. Plato, how much of it is historical Socrates? So I take the story and say, well, this mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. is what I'll analyze without caring about what portion is hi historical, what portion, because it is a story that is a That's teaching right. story. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. He sets up there are many teachers. people to do that. They take it ahistorically, and they don't root it into history. That's right. That's right. And and since uh, one of the arguments against that is the fact that since he put so much concern with uh, particular, particular things that are occurring in a society at a particular time, he, does, he himself has an interest in his own history. And therefore, and somehow you have to balance the two. But to the degree that significant data is external to the dialogue, it's to that degree if it's significant, and not part of the dialogue, to that degree it's a weak dialogue. So I certainly think that it's often worthwhile finding out what historians have, have been able to contribute to it, but to the degree that what they find is significant and essential to understanding the dialogue, to that degree Plato's vision was lacking. And I haven't seen that yet. But I do think it can support it and can add interesting features too. Okay. Thank you. We will play once more. Thank you.